In psychology, as in life, people are different. Of course, some people are more different than others, but at what point does difference tip over into abnormality? Abnormal is a pretty weighty term compared to different, so it's important to understand what it's used for within psychology, to break down the stigma around abnormality, if for nothing else. One way of looking at the normal-abnormal distinction is to use social norms as the basis of what is normal. Within social groups, norms develop which dictate the typical accepted way of doing things for members of that group. Deviation from the group norm may be an indication of psychological abnormality as it potentially demonstrates that a person is unable to understand or recognise group norms. It's an easy to understand concept of abnormality, but it is flawed. For example, there's no reason a drag queen can't also be a member of a men's rugby club. In one scenario, it would be totally expected to turn up with a full face of makeup and a push-up bra. In the other, it would be out of the ordinary. But there's nothing abnormal about a person who conforms to either or both of these social norms. The suggestion of abnormality would come into it if our rugby playing drag queen were unable to separate the norms of those two different social identities. But even if you do turn up to rugby training with six inch fake lashes, does that really make you categorically abnormal? Probably not if we consider a second categorization of abnormality, a failure to function adequately. What this means is that psychological abnormality is rooted in an inability to get through your day performing the typical daily tasks that we all aim to do. Get up in the morning, brush your teeth, remember to eat, go to work or study, maintain social contact with family or friends. If you're able to do all of these things without undue difficulty, then you could be said to be psychologically normal. On the other side of the coin, someone with OCD who's unable to go to work due to their obsessive compulsive behaviours, may be considered to be functioning abnormally by this definition. Generally this makes sense, although it is worth noting that there's a societal bias loaded onto a term like adequate functioning. For example, does the ability to hold down a job count as adequate functioning? Are all unemployed people therefore inadequately functioning and therefore abnormal? I don't think there's a strong argument to suggest this is the case. So to avoid being judgmental in our definition of abnormality, some psychologists prefer to turn to statistics instead. Measuring abnormality by statistical infrequency is an impersonal but non-judgmental way of defining abnormality. If 95% of people do X and 5% do Y, then statistically speaking, those who do Y are abnormal. It gives us a clear definition of normal or abnormal, but again, there are issues. About 1-2% to of the human population has red hair. Does this make redheads genetically abnormal? Statistically, yes. But does this have any real-world significance? It's worth jumping in at this point and reminding ourselves to separate the word abnormal from its stigma. The most intelligent people in society are, at least statistically, as abnormal as the least intelligent people. Finally, when thinking about psychological abnormality, there's deviation from ideal mental health. Considered against a measure of ideal mental health, those who don't match set criteria may be considered to be abnormal. Again, helpful to a point, but who really has ideal mental health? Most people will experience mental ill health at one point or another, just as with physical health. So this opens the question of whether we should reject the concept of an abnormal person and instead reframe the conversation around abnormal symptoms that a person might experience at periods of their life. In fairness, taken on their own, each of these four definitions of psychological abnormality are flawed. However, considered collectively, Deviation from social norms, failure to function adequately, statistical infrequency, and deviation from ideal mental health together offer us four criteria by which we can understand what it is to be abnormal. Or normal. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it and found it interesting. If you did, please give it a thumbs up to let me know. And if you've got any thoughts or questions, I look forward to reading them in the comment section below.
If it's your first time here, subscribe and hit that notifications bell so that you won't miss out on another video. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.